Hello, everybody, and welcome back from the lunch break. I um, hope you all managed to, to refresh and replenish yourselves. Um, up for you now, we have Giovanni Lesnar, who is uh, head of enterprise at API3, and he's delivering a talk on open insurance and smart contracts. Thank you very much, Joe, for joining us today. Welcome to API Days London, and um, I'll pop this over to yourself. Great. Thanks, Ben. Great. Welcome, everybody. I'll, I'll be your, your speaker for, for this session. Um, hopefully, you'll, you'll get a couple of takeaways from it. So how I like to present is, uh, you know, make it practical, make it uh, something that you can take away from this conference. So as Ben was mentioning, I'm the head of enterprise and partnerships at API3. Um, I generally work with Fortune 2000 companies in the enterprise space, um, but we also work with, with governments in terms of their, their blockchain needs. So in terms of getting things started, I just thought I'd just put an agenda just also to track the time um, in terms of what we're going to be speaking about. So initially for the first 15 minutes, we're going to speak about a primer around blockchain and smart contracts. We're then going to go into open finance and insurance and, and just kind of the open insurance space. And then also how API3 and the open bank projects are connectors of this API economy uh, and smart contracts. So that'll be about five minutes. And then I'll open up the floor for some questions and answers. So please post some questions in the chat and Ben will pick those up um, and we can have a nice discussion around those. So for most of you attending this conference, I think blockchain is, is, is a buzzword. It's also very new. We've seen, you know, with Bitcoin kind of, you know, pumping over the last couple of days, um, you know, in weeks, uh, a lot of hype in the mainstream media, as well as the, the dog uh, coins or meme coins, as, as one would call it. But I thought, you know, just to start uh, a blockchain prime is always good uh, just to kind of uh, get everybody up to speed with, you know, how this fits into smart contracts and how this then fits into open insurance. So, you know, trust with blockchain. Blockchain is a distributed ledger, you know, shared by all participants. Uh, it's replicated, decentralized. It's an append-only mechanism that provides a distributed transaction in a way that can be validated, reaching consensus, as well as being verified. And in that way, nobody can actually delete or update or amend these transactions. So it makes it a very secure mechanism. And as you can see the image here on the, the right-hand uh, side of the, the screen, um, that just shows you that um, in a blockchain, the previous block is a fingerprint. I mean, the future block is a, a fingerprint of the previous block. So it follows the whole provenance or history of that blockchain transaction. But in terms of what blockchain promises is that, you know, it increases trust in the value uh, of exchange. It, you know, it reduces third parties in the relationship. So you can trust the data and you don't have to trust the parties that are there. There's no single point of failure because it is decentralized in that many computers um, are busy validating these. So there's no single point of failure. It has an increased security mechanism through its cryptography, very efficient and also faster and cheaper than relying on a longer chain of intermediaries. And, and I'm sure when we speak about financial services or insur insurance services, we, we think of many parties involved, lots of paperwork. So this is a perfect technology for that. But most importantly, this you know, leads towards programmable money or programmable blockchain. And uh, examples of this would be Ethereum. So what are smart, smart contracts? So just starting, you know, the history traced back to the 1990s. And what's quite exciting about it, like interesting about this is if you look at Netflix as an example, Netflix, um, you know, was around for quite some time. It only took off once the cost of uh, da data storage came down as well as bandwidth increased um, in terms of internet connection. So even though smart contracts have been around since the 1990s, they needed to wait for this catalytical technology known as blockchain to actually kind of uh, uh, show, debut themselves in this prime time. So Wei Dai uh, was the, the, the kind of initial, um, you know, thought leader in, in smart contracts. So he created an anonymous loan scheme with redeemable uh, bonds and lump sum taxes to be collected at maturity all automatically. We also saw then Nick Sabo came and kind of perfected uh, Wei Dai's model where he proposed using cryptographic mechanisms to enhance the security. So this is where the blockchain fits into that. So if you think of a smart contract, you can just think of a computer program running on top of a blockchain or blockchain nodes that is distributed among untrusted or anonymous parties without the involvement of the third party. So you can trust in the technology to 
to to basically validate um, and and execute itself. In terms of the first successful implementation, we did see that with Bitcoin, Bitcoin script, and that was a simple form such as you know pay to script hash. But we have evolved uh, since since Bitcoin's inception in 2008, 2009, and we've seen other contractual functionalities, more complex ones, come to the forefront through Ethereum, and that's Ethereum's virtual machine. But we can also see that this technology is still in its infancy, and um, there's still kind of a little bit of a longer way to go until this is, you know, really fully adopted in every business across the world. But I think from the Harvard Law School, the best way you can put a smart contract is the code is law. So that is the program. And even more interesting, you know, if you really want to kind of deep dive into this topic, um, smart contracts and blockchain have enabled a new form of governance, a new form of organizational structure called a DAO a decentralized autonomous organization. So uh, for those of you that are interested in this, please go Google that, have a look at it, and it, it'll be a complete uh, you know, change of mind in terms of how that works. But why do we need smart contracts? I think that's kind of the main question here. So because they're running on a blockchain, it shows an immutable record of the data uh, as before the underlying technology. Blockchain then mitigates a single source of failure. It, it kind of enables autonomous functions. So, you know, we're looking at Tesla, we're seeing self-driving vehicles, we're seeing robotics, AI, all of, the, all of these fourth industrial revolution technologies following an autonomous approach. So if you look at smart contracts, they help automate administrative functions and things uh, that require, uh, you know, validation by many parties in the value chain. So just think of it as a, a smart contract can then automatically trigger under certain conditions, that's known as a parametric or parameter-based smart contract, certain outcomes. But in order for those to, to, to function, you'll see as we go through the presentation, um, I'll explain a bit further um, how we solve that. So traditional paper contracts rely on middlemen and third parties, and this is what smart contracts can do. Uh, but in terms of smart contracts, there are two types. You get public smart contracts and you get permission smart contracts, which I'll explain in the next slide. But this is not the Pangea of, of everything. You know, there is a caveat. There are challenges that still exist to smart contract adoption. You know, because it's code, there are bugs which can be exploited. So we need to have, you know, code verification. There also needs to be compliance aspect with mandatory regulation which requires programmers and lawyers to, to basically collaborate and work together or be one of the same. And that requires changes to legacy laws and regulations, as well as updates to the underlying blockchain being a source of risk. So the two main types of public and permission smart contracts, and I'm just gonna kind of zip through this one. Public smart contracts uh, are like your Ethereum uh, based blockchain. It's an open ledger for all to view. Anybody can interact with it. Anybody can create a, a smart contract on top of Ethereum. But the way that Ethereum works and a lot of these blockchains is in order to prevent spam, um, which I'm sure we all you know aware of, unsolicited emails, as well as unsolicited calls to the computer, they have put something in there, which is a fee. And there, it's referred to as gas. So gas is needed to run on a blockchain uh, or utilize the Ethereum virtual machine or world computer, if one could put it that way. And in terms of its applications, you can create decentralized applications, which, as always, are censorship resistant, have zero, zero downtime. But you can create other applications, such as identity management. You know, digital identity is a massive one. Uh, we even seen governments um, exploring this, such as the German government. Uh, also, financial and, and value transfer applications. But very exciting is the synthetics. So these are tokenized or real world assets that are converted into a digital form that then are tradable in a frictionless and very cost effective manner on a blockchain. So permission smart co contracts on the other hand are used by you know your larger, more sensitive business uh, use cases. So uh, consortia or collaborations. So they would use something like a hyperledger or, or a quorum to, to facilitate that. And that would look at banking, insurance, you know, voting as well as providence and supply chain. So all of this then leads us to the topic of open finance. Now that we understand blockchain, we understand smart contracts, we understand the value that it adds, um, open finance is basically a, a subset, uh, well, the superset rather, is open banking and insurance. They make up open finance. And looking at open banking, uh, these regulations came into to effect 
under the second uh, payment service directive to make uh, banks open up their APIs so that um, so that businesses can create new use cases, but customers can also decide how and where they provide their data to. So this creates you know a broader range of financial services and, and products uh, around savings and investment. And I think just for the the jargon of uh, you know blockchain, there's something called DeFi. Um, and that's decentralized finance. So these are kind of investment tools that are running with smart contracts on top of a blockchain. And these are referred to as Web 3.0. And as I always like to say it, you know, Web 3 is the internet of value. And then we've got your traditional sector, which is your centralized finance or CFI. And that's your Web 2.0, which is your, your internet of information. So we can see that there's been a convergence now across the ecosystem between CFI and DeFi. Uh, where we are then moving from information to value. In terms of open banking APIs, I'm sure you guys have heard all about this today, so I'm not going to bore you with with uh, another you know session of repetition. But just in essence, uh, allowing your APIs to be open allows DApps to create new DApps, which are decentralized applications, to create new financial products. And that is like you know banking as a service, uh, insurance, stock or pensions uh, products, as well as credit scoring aggregations. And that's where the convergence of DeFi and CFI happen. In terms of open insurance, this is quite an exciting one. It's still, it's still quite early. So it is a, the movement is growing towards open insurance, but it's not mandated as of yet. So this would more than likely follow in the footsteps of open bank projects or open the open banking frameworks around the second payments services directive, where open insurance companies would allow customers to access and share their data with other insurers or other third parties in a safe, agile, accurate, and convenient way. It speaks a lot to how does the insurance sector open these APIs up in an interoperable way? How do they integrate that? How do they place the customer at the heart of the process and the business? But also, how do they create new use cases that are, would not be possible currently because the data is siloed? And I think parametric insurance is probably one of the most exciting kind of areas to delve into, which uses parameters that then self-executes. I think a, a, a really nice one is also insurance as a service product can, can be created, such as microinsurance. And, and a good example is, you know, I know there's lots of cyclists out there. Um, and you know you could be you know tap into your ins your your life insurance policy, and you could say to them, you know, every time you're getting on your bicycle, you're going out on the road, you get you get that personal cover. And then obviously on the other hand, the life insurer also is able to to price that risk in uh, more more accordingly. So you basically pay pay insurance for when it's needed. And this and in terms of open insurance, would follow more than likely similar similar guidelines as the second payment service directive as well as the global data protection regulation and just you can just have a look here on the screen quickly these are some of uh, the nations that are, are pursuing this through public consultations so we have seen brazil just publishing you know guidelines and standards towards um, open insurance and also in italy they're exploring the open initiative uh, insurance initiative i think interestingly enough uh, by 2025, 67% of insurances, insurance businesses are going to actually change their business model. And I think that is something that we shouldn't take lightly. You know, change is disruptive and exponential. So, you know, I completely agree with Will Towers Watson's report uh, in this aspect. But just interestingly, we can just look at, um, as an example, uh, the, um, you know, IoT devices being used in tandem with insurance policies. So if you are healthier and uh, you know you exercise and you wear your Apple iWatch or your Samsung um, watch, and that data is provided to insurer, you'll get lower premiums because they are getting the data that actually tells them that you are less of a a longer lo like a longer tail risk in in this in this um, case. But I also think nationwide insurance and risk stream, which is a consortium of of um, insurers focusing on blockchain technology is also very interesting so please have a look and delve into those use cases i think in terms of banking we see smart contracts being you know just as an example around mortgages or, or home loans where you know customers could save 960 dollars per loan and this is this is according to a cap gemini report as well as banks being able to cut between three and 11 billion dollars of annual costs just on administration all of that money can then be, you know, diverted to to more productive uses, uh, maybe green technologies, uh, the employees' wellness programs, etc. But I think another big use case around this would be 
looking at know your customer requirements, anti-money laundering, as well as open banking APIs um, that will allow Web3 to actually create these new digital uh, services and products that are not currently available. And that all enables a frictionless digital service. And on the insurance side, um, also won't spend too much time on this, is around the parametric insurance. You know, that could be uh, related to, say, um, insurance related to solar electricity generation. So if your business is generating electricity and we are seeing more and more decentralization of energy provision, so that is the, the energy cloud, right? Where, um, you know, energy is provided closer to, to, the, to where it's needed than it is in a, you know, a, a government owned electricity uh, grid. And in that way, you could take out insurance that if there's a certain downtime on the solar due to, you know, the weather, um, an insurance product would kick in and, and that would be all on a smart contract. We see the same with travel, with the auto industry, agriculture and log logistics, as well as, you know, blockchain for proof of insurance. So I see, you know, I see that the insurance sector is a perfect use case for smart contracts and for blockchain. But um, it's all around how do you kind of remove these kind of um, areas of, of vulnerability and area in areas that of error around administrative processes. So in terms of smart contracts, APIs, and decentralized applications, uh, the two most important aspects, and I think this will then qualify the rest of this presentation is that if you are running a decentralized application, you have two main two main uh, critical points. One is the data input function. And the second one is the data val validation or data security function. So if you look at the data input function, this is where the data gets inserted into the blocks or the, on the blockchain through trusted data oracles. And um, you know, this is via APIs that are through API gateways. Uh, and then if you're looking at the data security perspective, that is around cryptography. But if any one of these two are compromised, a smart contract exploit can occur. And just yesterday, fresh off the press, we had over $100 million exploits occurring on a DeFi protocol or, or product called Cream Finance uh, that were exploited in the smart contract. And this is where, you know, I introduce API 3. So API 3 has the mission to fully make APIs compatible to Web 3.0. This is so that dApps and smart contracts can consume data in a way that is trusted in a first party nature, eliminating third parties. So if you think about it, APIs are the glues of the internet. You know, we've seen business models such as Uber, eBay, Airbnb, all powered by APIs, completely, you know, infrastructureless companies. And that's all by connecting APIs and the flow of data. So if you think about that, Web3 must be able to access any kinds of services that the web is currently offering uh, in order to interact with the real world. And also for, for smart contracts or parametric products to actually know what the data input function is. So this will allow, you know, new digital agreements, expanding markets for decentralized networks and new products to come about. So what is API 3? So we've, we've termed it API 3 because this is a third iteration of the API for, the, for, the, for Web 3.0. And since 2018, API's predecessor, you know, we worked on connecting APIs to Web 3 and we saw that limitations actually drove us to innovate and create uh, novel solutions that benefit API data providers as well as those that consume the data on the demand side, which are decentralized apps and smart contracts. So with API 3, we created a product called the AirNode, which I'll also explain in the next slide, but that is EVM, Ethereum Virtual Machine, smart contract compatible, um, but we are also blockchain agnostic, meaning that where we see the future is the AirNode as an open source infrastructure, uh, infrastructure of a service will then be able to connect to other blockchains and you'd be able to connect your APIs in essence to all the blockchains. So API 3 and the Open Bank project have also formed a 10-year partnership, which is to you know, bring Open Bank APIs to Web 3.0. This one here, I'll just skip over. So just in a high level, um, we API 3's business model is around, you know, one of the products we are providing is data insurance on mis mission critical data feeds. So as I, as I mentioned, a smart contract consumes data. If that data is incorrect, it leads to an incorrect outcome. So where API 3 fits in is we kind of bring that integrity back to the API economy through this API gateway called the AirNode.
So in terms of the, the current issue that API3 is solving is the smart contract and decentralized app API connectivity problem. So blockchains have their own consensus mechanism uh, and they cannot connect directly with web 2.0 APIs. So you need a type of infrastructure that allows you to connect in that way. There are, there are third party data solutions out there but you're entrusting a third party to relay the information. Whereas if you could just run the infrastructure yourself, you can ensure that the data is correct in the first place. So with any third party, trust is minimized and um, this obviously decreases cost efficiencies. So what we've done is we've created an enterprise ready, also a government state ready uh, API gateway that is open source called the Air Node which is a simple serverless function that allows an API to connect to blockchains, but without the active management and the use of third parties. So it's maintenance free. You can connect it to any kind of cloud provider. We also cloud provider agnostic, but if you're using AWS, it's a simple Lambda function um, and you remain in full control of your data. So it is GDPR compliant. Yes, Ben. Oh, no, I'm just coming back on to listen to the talk before any questions get answered. Oh, yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. I thought you were asking a question. Not a problem. So I was just mentioning to the audience that, you know, with the with the Air Node, it's uh, GDPR compliant, and we've actually built this from the ground up. So if you think of this, this data oracle, uh, it has privacy by design ingrained into it. So it has built-in control features that allow any API data provider that wants to monetize the data to Web 3.0 to control certain parameters, but also control the infrastructure at the end of the day. And just a quick, you know, benefits is, I think one of the main ones is the set and forget. Once you've set it up, you know, it's maintenance free. Um, and it's also built on top of your page, you go services. So we, you can deploy this for free. It is an open source infrastructure. We also have a cryptocurrency free option. We do know enterprises don't like taking on, you know, balance sheet risk. So you can also accept fiat current, uh, currency for, for your API uh, data. And just in terms of, of what we've done is, um, you know, the API3 Alliance, we have over 150 APIs of varied data sources that have joined the ecosystem to provide the, these data sources to these dApps and smart contracts. So if you're an insurance provider and you were creating a parametric weather insurance product, you would more than likely connect to one of these AirNode products uh, that provides you weather data into that parametric product. And we also work with use cases as, as part of the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. In terms of our so, tenure partnership, yep. So yeah, Joe, Joe um, just, just we've got a, a few minutes left, so just conscious of that. I just wanted to ask, um, something i pulled out there was you know param parameter based uh, outcomes so uh, maybe you're about to lead into that but what what um what types of you know early use cases are you are you seeing and and how do you think adoption will play out yeah perfect i think that's definitely a good question i also just let me just quickly end off the the slide show here i've only got like two slides so I think you just beat me to it. But I, I was just saying that, uh, you know, the Open Bank Project is, is our strategic partner. So, you know, we work with them quite extensively on making over 400 banking APIs, you know, connected to, to Web 3.0. They work with regulators as well as large customers, as you can see in the slide. And, and just as a high level, um, you know, diagram, this would be something where, you know, you'd connect your API and then you'd basically uh, provide that to these these dApps and services. So, yeah, you just beat me to that, Ben. So happy for those questions. So in terms of, of the parametric, uh, parametric products and insurance, what we're seeing is, um, you know, parametric products around travel. So if you think about, uh, you know, traveling and your flight gets canceled, uh, you know, that would be an insurance on your airline ticket that automatically pays you out if it's if it's cancelled due to you know extreme conditions. And users can be rest assured that when they when they know what the parameters are, they know yeah. what they're engaging in when they're taking out that insurance policy. So there's no what ifs or buts. It, like you know, what did a volcano erupt over Iceland, grounding all the planes? Yes. Did I like miss my flight because of that? Yes. And that gets fed into the parametric product and automatically compensates. Um, the end customer. And that also makes the administrative burden, you know, reduced from the insurance provider because all they do is they connect those APIs into the smart contract, executes, and then, um, you know, that happens. So we're seeing that. We're also seeing, um, you know, parametric insurance in, in terms of agriculture as well as in terms of the auto industry. 
Super interesting, Joe. Uh, thank you very much for that deep dive into what is the foundations for Web 3.0, right? And um, uh, giving some context to how that's starting to, I guess, emerge with traditional finance and traditional financial services. So super, super interesting. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I'm sure we'll see you again on uh, the next API days. Thanks Definitely. So and if, if, if anyone wants to reach out, you know, feel free. You've got my detail. Uh, like I said, we work with enterprises, insurers, uh, even government agencies. We are just happy to, to have a conversation around how we can make that a reality uh, in terms of Web 3.0. Thanks, Ben.